Uh, so thank you for having me. Before we get started, I would just like to remind all of our listeners that anything shared today, um, any opinions expressed are those of my own um, and not of my company. We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our next guest on the interview series, Vanessa Sandoval. She is the Senior Director of Human Resources at Hearst Magazines. Vanessa, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself or our listeners, including your pronouns. And when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, yes. I'm happy to introduce myself. Thank you for having me. Hello to all of our listeners. Um, my name is Vanessa Sandoval. She, she her, hers are my pronouns. Um, I think I would identify as um, a Latinx uh, millennial, uh, in New York City, uh, originally from Texas, and um, happy to be part of this conversation. Um, I I think growing up, I I know there were aspirations to be everything from like an actress to like a figure skater to a lawyer um, to a teacher. Uh, and so none of those included HR professional. I will say that. <laughs> Rarely do people say, you know, when I was seven years old, I wanted to be in human resources or anything of that nature. I think it's interesting to reflect back and see kind of where we thought we would be. Fast forward to today. How do you think your kind of personal journey has really led you to be in HR and specifically at Hearst Magazines? Um, I, you know, I'm definitely not a traditional HR professional in that I didn't go to school um, to study this, but I will say that I, there is a sort of common thread in all of not only my education, but the experiences that I've had professionally. Um, they tend to center around people and or cultures, understanding language. I, my undergraduate degree is in linguistics. I have a master's in education. I did spend time in a classroom for um, a limited point of time with Teach for America. And I think ultimately landing uh, in an HR business role capacity here at Hearst, I've, I've been able to, and really in every role, been able to sort of um, leverage every experience and sort of build on um, how I show up for not only myself and my team, but um, the employees that I, you know, work to support every day. Yeah, absolutely. And you're working with people every day, which is exciting and also challenging as well. I think we've all heard that uh, folks are moving towards more human-centric, people-first um, approach, especially in terms of talent and company culture. You shared that it's important for you to keep people at the center of your work, especially being on the people team. Can you share for folks who are listening what that really looks like in practice and what do you kind of mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's especially today. I mean, we as humans and society have just been through so much um, in the last couple of years, especially. And, you know, I think if you were to sort of look from the lens of like, what is it like to live in the U.S. with like an American centralized um, sort of sort of like this idealistic work mentality. I think historically that meant one thing and that has evolved and changed. I think people traditionally, you know, maybe had more separation between their personal life and work life or work persona. Um, I, now with social media, with the idea that we are in each other's living rooms potentially every day, um, it changes, right? And it has changed. And I think it has allowed not only our team, but most teams and most people, leaders and, and just employees in general to understand that we're all human. <laughs> we all come with our individual stories. And um, yes, it's important to get the work done, um, but it's also really important to recognize that 
everyone is playing a part. And if we don't allow people to bring their whole selves to work, um, it, it's we're asking people to contort themselves. And so I think when it, what having employee centered conversations or programs for me, what that means is just how does this land um, with the people that it's impacting, right? If we're designing a program, like what's the actual experience? If we are, if there's conflict on a team, like it's less about resolving everything in the moment and more about helping folks understand that there may be two different perspectives for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, long, long way and roundabout way of, of answering your question, but I think people-centered work just keeps it not only realistic and practical, but also um, just the, allows you to demonstrate empathy for everyone's journey. Absolutely. And like you said, everybody has their individual stories, the journeys of getting here at different points of their career and lives, their story is different than my story, then it's different than my manager's. Um, and the only way that we would know that is if you kind of build that environment where you have empathy, you have the space to be vulnerable and share uh, kind of your path as well when you're comfortable. Um, and I think a lot of leaders have been talking about this as well as their responsibility to really model that behavior and set the tone for their team, for their organization. How do you lead with empathy as your role as a true kind of business partner and why is it important now more than ever, kind of digging in deeper to what you're just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it involves a lot of listening, to be honest. Um, in my role, you know, I, I sort of play in four spaces. Um, as that partner there, you know, we're, we're sort of like this emergency responder in some ways, because there are always things popping up and we have to be able to address them in the moment. Um, there's, there's obviously, you know, like what a lot of folks believe HR to be, which is like policy operations, compliance, right. Um, helping folks understand sort of how things get done, um, operationally in, in a business setting. Um, there, there's a part that allows us to mediate, right? So oftentimes when tensions arise and, and that is sort of where a lot of the listening comes into play um, because we can play the role of, um, I, yes, I can give folks recommendations, right? And, and, and suggest or sort of give them the, the way to resolve this. Um, but then in the event that the, the situation comes up again, they may not be armed with the tools or be able to flex that muscle again because they haven't actually practiced it. And sometimes, you know, it's a little bumpy through execution, but we're there to help. And so um, that mediation space is sort of, where we find a lot of our time um, as a true business partner. And then also there's the strategy, right? It's that last phase and where if we're not, if we don't truly understand the goals of the business, um, you know, then, then we can't come to the conversation as a consultant when we're addressing like people and talent um, discussions and, and discourse. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, what I find interesting is that I, I would never, ever walk onto a, a sales floor or walk up to an engineer or co a coder and say like, hey, I, you know, that looks really great, but I think you should change this code. Um, I am not the subject matter expert. Um, however, I do think that um, as an HR professional, our expertise is people and talent. Um, and I, I often have to remind myself that not everyone understands what we do, but they will always have opinions on how we should do it. Um, and so walking in as a consultant to the business, um, I have to understand that they may not believe that I am that subject matter expert. So while I know where I need them to land, it's in the coaching, it's in the listening that we help guide them to feel empowered to solve their own sort of tensions and situations that arise related to people. 
Yeah, absolutely. You want to empower folks, really enable them to do their best work. And you can give people the tools that have, they apply it on a day-to-day -day basis when something comes up as well. In your kind of career, can you give an example of how you really help folks unlock their full potential and really find those answers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, it sort of anchors on listening. I think um, it's a combination where I've seen folks grow and what's really awesome to, to see happen um, in, in a workplace is to see someone who recognizes that they need help um, and who isn't afraid to ask for resources and um, advice. And so, and then not only be open and willing, right, to receive that, but then actually try it and test drive and, um, and then come back and sort of share the success. Um, I've seen it time and time again, and it's so rewarding. Um, I would say that it's rewarding for most folks, but I think, uh, for me, I can only speak for myself and not all HR professionals, but for me, it's just really nice to be able to know that we have helped someone um, feel more confident in their capability um, in the workplace. And so that oftentimes, that sponsorship, that encouragement, that empowerment, um, and, and the willingness to be there in the event that it doesn't go well, um, I think has helped folks feel like they can unlock their potential. Um, and oftentimes we, we forget to ask. Like I do, I do recognize that in some of the conversations that I've had where managers tend to struggle with their teams, um, they're often creating narratives for themselves around what could be happening in the background um, or what could be influencing a situation. And oftentimes just asking the question, what is keeping you from asking them directly um, puts them in a, in a space of, you know, being a little bit retrospective um, and, and also then helps them realize like that is an option. Like we can just directly ask, what are you excited to contribute, right? Or what do you feel, um, what excites you the most? What, how would you like to show up? Um, and, and help us meet X, Y, Z goal. Um, and I think oftentimes there's, um, you know, the confusion, a sort of misalignment around expectation because it's traditionally like a top-down directive and mentality when, when realistically it should be a conversation. And so, again, we're all coming with our own individual experiences. And while you may have hired someone because in a brief conversation, they're able to demonstrate competency or they know how to phrase something that like checks off your buzzwords. Um, there's, there's such an array of experiences that may not have even happened in a professional setting that would allow someone to add value to not only your team, but your work. And so I see our role um, in, in reminding folks that unlocking potential is, again, just really being inclusive and, and willing and open to different perspectives and approaches. Yeah, you have to come in with that curiosity, kind of ask those open-ended questions and, and have a conversation. Don't come in with assumptions and kind of right. keep those role of, of work and kind of what they're passionate about as well. You have to be active in that conversation and, and listen um, as yeah. well. I definitely agree with that. Something else that uh, we also kind of discussed was that role of like the quote unquote work-life balance. I definitely think it's a, a kind of facade because balance is, is a tricky kind of thing to accomplish. I think work-life blend is more the term here as well. And like you said, most people are in people's living rooms. What are your thoughts on the role of work in your life? Um, obviously it's easier said than done. Um, I think, you know, work-life plan, work-life. I, I don't I don't like the phrase to be honest because um, it also sort of makes it seem like they're only 
sort of two spaces that people can play in. Um, and I think um, work-life integration is, is something that not everyone has a ton of, um, I, I guess, depending on like your role and the years of experience, I find that um, at least for me in my younger, earlier career, like years, um, I thought work was life, right? Because, and you can maybe, that could be because I'm Latina and I was raised to believe that you, you know, work hard and keep your head down and like results, like the work will speak for itself. And, um, you know, I think there were times where I was burnt out and um, thought that it was the only way to contribute um, professionally. And I think that's not necessarily the case for this, for like early career folks now. I think um, that on some level, it's probably a little bit more, um, I guess it's, it's also just like, more commonly spoken about it's it's it could be a factor because we're all on social and you know like this concept of like quiet quitting which is like a whole other conversation it's just language matter words matter um so i i don't want to claim that like the phrase work life balance is bad and i think that the intention is to help folks realize that you can sort of craft what works for you. Um, but I do think that um, it's very much an individual um, experience. And I think for some company cultures, um, I think what's important for anyone that wants to succeed, regardless of sort of where you are, the, the size of the organization, the, the composition of your team, where you sort of sit in the hierarchy, it is important to make sure that you understand what success for that um, for that environment looks like, sounds like, um, so that as an individual, you can either opt in or decide to find an environment that is more aligned and, and that you're willing to opt in on. I think oftentimes, and, I, and I, I've seen it, um, in just different organizations that I've worked with, right? There's this tension between, well, what do employees want and what is, you know, the company want? Um, and there's this like back and forth dance. Um, and I think oftentimes it's made a lot more complex and that instead of aligning on like values, right? And how we should be showing up, um, people focus on, the structural pieces, right? So like, well, how many days am I going in? And why, why must I sit in a cube? Or why do I have to sit next to someone? Like, granted that if that's high on someone's value chain, let's acknowledge it. Um, but I will say I do find it interesting and it's definitely a challenging piece, especially now that we're in a hybrid environment um to truly define what company culture is i think that is more malleable now <laughs> um than maybe historically right and i think sentiment around who can um chime in on that has changed especially over the last you know two two and a half years since the pandemic it's definitely changed and people have had a lot of time to reflect on what they're looking for from their workplace, what they're looking from from their leaders. Why would they stay? Why would they go? And for company culture, it's a lot of things, right? It's the, the patterns, the norms, spoken, unspoken, written, and unwritten. And part of that is in addition to celebrating and, you know, uh, recognizing how people are rewarded at work. It's also how folks navigate things like hard conversations, the tension, the, the conflict. And we know that only about 39%, according to one study of folks, um, are, you know, really trained or coached and 
handling workplace conflict. I would argue uh, some of us, if not most of us, are a little conflict avoidant, uh, but it definitely comes up, but it's not, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. What is your advice for folks to be empowered to have these conversations and navigate these waters uh, in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting that, um, like, if we were, if we were having a one on one right now, and the phrase, you know, you use the phrase, um, you know, a lot of folks are conflict avoidant or conflict averse. Um, conflict, I think, tends to have a negative conversation, um, or connotation, excuse me, and I'm actually a fan of conflict. That's um, good. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's that, like, child in me that like wanted to be a lawyer and like thinks that it's like it's it's healthy to debate right as long as it's respectful it's health it's okay to challenge as long as it's respectful and um it's done in a way that um you know you're not like leaving bodies on the floor as you you know try to to share your perspective but um i conflict excites me, which is probably an odd thing to hear from an HR professional. But the reason I, I say that it excites me, um, and, and again, when I think about my role as an HR business partner and a consultant to the business, for me, it's an opportunity to help folks unpack what may actually be happening, right? So yes, there are um, some times where it's, it's maybe a little bit more uh, cut and dry with like, well, you can't say X things in the workplace, right? Like there are just rules of engagement around how you engage with others in a, in a moment of conflict. Um, you can't walk around like punching people. Like that's hard no, right? Um, and I also think that, um, and again, this may come from just like my fascination with language and linguistics in general, um, and just like sociolinguistics, um, there's there could be so much that can be happening in in an interaction um, that is stemming from someone's upbringing or from someone's culture and their their value set and or from just like general construction of language right where folks place a, a question word um, can give a completely different um, impression on, on either the ask or the demand, right? Um, and, and helping folks realize that is part of what excites me because it's an opportunity to expand um, the understanding of like humans in general. And so I think if we're, if we are operating from a point that assumes best intention, right? No one is waking up saying, I'm going to make Vanessa's life difficult. Um, or I should say, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that's not the case. Um, and and I, I, I have to remind folks, because in the moment, tensions can get high, right? Emotions are valid. And so if someone is feeling some sort of way, we shouldn't dismiss that. Um, because that's not going to feel great, and it, and it's it's important for them to recognize they can they can acknowledge the emotion, and then work through it. Um, and as they work through it, I offer insights into what could potentially be happening. Um, and if we can't confirm based on data that we already have, um, then we should again directly ask what you know what was someone thinking what how did it make them feel what led them to react this way right um i i often share um I'm, this is a little bit of a tangent but i but i sh i share a framework with folks when i work with them um it's called the sbi model and and it anchors on situation behavior impact and it's it's um i don't know if you're familiar with it or if you've heard of this it's a little um, yeah yeah, so, and it's been really helpful to anchor on the facts, right? And to, to um, sort of remove, while emotions are valid and important and informative, um, it, it allows us to anchor on the actual behaviors that someone is exhibiting and 
and allows us to sort of tease out both impact and um, intention, right? Oftentimes folks will say, well, that's not how I meant it. Um, or I didn't mean for those behaviors to come off that way and helping them understand you may not have intended for it to be that way, but this is how it impacted either the business, the person, the situation. Um, and, and it removes that emotional component and keeps it sort of um, in the front part of the brain that allows for rational decision-making um, as opposed to letting that amygdala hijack take over, right? In which all emotions sort of shut down that front part of your brain, um, which is when folks land in my office, on, you know, sometimes. Um, and so what we've, we've sort of like gone on a tangent, all that to say, like, I do think um, conflict can be good so long as we manage it uh, in a way, again, that keeps people whole, that isn't damaging and um, in a way where we're where all parties are committed to working through that. Conflict is inescapable and having the tools and resources and frameworks like that to come into a conversation to say, okay, what are the facts? And also active listening as we've been talking about throughout this conversation yeah. is so important and coming in with that growth mindset and just with an open mind as well. Um, they're key skills to have and like any skill, it's important to practice and, and continue to practice easier said than done. But yeah. I think it's also very helpful as well of how we show up inside and, and outside of work. Vanessa, I wanna pass the mic back to you to see if there's anything that I didn't specifically ask that you would like to share or underscore any kind of key takeaways you hope people bring with them after hearing our conversation today. Um, I mean, I know the majority of, of your listeners um, are connected to HR in some capacity. So um, in a moment of solidarity, I would love to just um, recognize how tough our jobs are, um, especially these two past years. I think um, not only is our job and our role oftentimes misunderstood, um, we are also expected to have all the answers all the time. And there's, um, especially for people of color, I would say a small place for error, like a small margin allowable um, for any misstep, which is really, really difficult. And I think these past two years, not only have we had to um, flex our expertise for, you know, and, and knowledge around talent and people management, but we've also had to be the um, medical consultant. We've also had to be the um, building uh, operations and, um, you know, with return to office, like, navigating maybe reconstructing the the building or the seating layouts right there's we've had to be counselors we've had to be um grief uh consultants and i think that that is a huge responsibility and i know that it, oftentimes people don't think the hr teams and so my final thing I would say is we are doing a damn good job. So for every HR professional out there, um, thank you. And people are thankful and they just forget to say it. Is what I would say. I think, by the way, I think we lost your sound because I can't hear you Christina but I see you I see you talking <laughs> interesting can you hear me now okay I can hear you now okay, great um I think that's a great note to end on and also just a great reminder that the work that everybody is doing is really important and even if somebody forgets to say and doesn't acknowledge it you are seen and it is important to recognize as well and show up for one another and have that conversation Vanessa, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Thank you for having me.
Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood, and know it's a requirement for the business to succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.